most original talk radio station anywhere. We are LA Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Oscar's Guitar Shop with Oscar Jordan right here on LA Talk Radio. My name is Oscar Jordan. I'm Vintage Guitar Magazine contributing writer. I am burdened with glorious purpose. Yes, I am. Hey, how y'all doing? Yeah. Howdy, howdy, howdy. <laughs> hey, don't stop now. Give me, give me what you got. Give it up. Y'all better wake up. Yes, I want it all, baby. Give me a cappuccino. Um, wow. Hey, okay, that's enough of that. Hey, I'm really excited to uh, be here, and uh, I've got this great show lined up for you. It's full of unadulterated mayhem, wholesale tomfoolery, and Beatlesque hijinks. Yes, I have all of that. I do. You're going to love this. This is great. It's going to be really, really cool. Oh, I just thought of something. Uh, tomorrow, Sunday, I'm going to be uh, hosting the uh, panel discussion um, for the L.A. Amp Show in Van Nuys. So if, uh, it's, gonna, it's going on Saturday and Sunday, um, starting uh, Saturday tomorrow and then Sunday the day after that. But it's going to be really cool. I'm hosting the Players Paradise panel discussion. they got all these cool players and do to actually make money playing guitar, believe it or not, and I'm going to talk to them about how they do that and how maybe you can do it too. Uh, if you'd like to help uh, support Oscars Guitar Shop, go to OscarsGuitarShop.com, click donations to the show, give to relieve the deep-seated guilt. Give, baby. Want to become a sponsor? Email me at OscarsGuitarShop at gmail.com. Oscar's Guitar Shop is powered by Music Connection Magazine, informing music people, industry professionals, and support services since 1977. Visit them at musicconnection.com. Also, True Tone Music. Visit them at truetonemusic.com, making your music come to life. And last but not least, Mojave Ampworks. Visit the Oasis of Tone at MojaveAmpWorks.com. Find out what Peter Frampton, Billy Gibbons, and George Lynch are talking about. MojaveAmpWorks.com. And now, it's time. <laughs> Take it all back home, but leave it country fried. If you so much, just take a taste, it'll change your whole life. I bet your buddy gets you way downtown and makes you feel just right. So 
organs emerged from the smoldering embers of long-haired high-tech shred specialists to distinguish himself with his own voice and unique musicality. He presented us with a musical alternative that embodied a soulful fusion of country, blues, and jazz dressed up with his own indelible fiery touch. His debut self-titled album won Best New Talent and one of the most influential players of the next 10 years in guitar for the Practicing Musician magazine. He was also a runner-up in Guitar Player magazine's Best New Talent and Reader's Poll. He's gone on to crank out one great album after the next, evolving his technical guitar style and mining soulful influences that draw from the best in blues, roots, and southern rock. His new album, Yep, is a southern rock opus filled with gut bucket guitar wrangling, back porch slide, heartfelt vocals, and swamp. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Michael Lee Perkins. Yay! How you doing? How you doing there? What is happening? <laughs> man. Wow, you I, got I, applause, man. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn, after that song? Jesus, man. That, the tones you're getting is like, holy Christ, man. Oh, I yeah, love that. I, I haven't heard that since I mixed it. I actually enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> man, I just, oh, I, I love that that raw, visceral, gut-level resonance stuff, man. You, you're you just nailing that, man. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. How do you do that? Uh, Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I try not to, to think too much about it. I don't compose my solos anymore. Um, I just hope for the best. And uh, you just keep trying, and uh, just when you think you, you can't do it, you know, you just try a little bit harder, and uh, there it goes. <laughs> there you go. Well, you're doing something right, man. It sounded great. Uh, Thank you. To the to the uh, listeners in Radioland, I just interviewed you earlier this week uh, for an c- upcoming article in Vintage Guitar Magazine, and we had a great talk, and uh, I, I wish we could have gone more into depth, you know, the word count thing and all that, but what what was still trying to I'm trying to wrap my brain around this is that it took you ten years to make this record. Are you serious? Yeah, ten yeah, years? it's kind of crazy. I mean, it wasn't like I was sitting around, uh, <laughs> you know, working on it the whole time. It felt like I was, but I really was, and I I took a lot of breaks and um, did a you know I did other records during that time, but uh, this this thing I don't know. <laughs> you know, I've done records in two weeks and two months and two years, but this one was uh, was a biggie. <laughs> you're you're, you're kind of like the Steely Dan of slide guitar, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Why, did they have a record that went on forever? Uh, well, the famous Asia <laughs> took them like 14 years to make it or something like that, some mythology story. Oh, right? God. I no, know. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, but anyway, you know what? I've been wearing out the record since I got it from your publicist, and uh, oh, it just it's so vibey. And I'm hearing these great southern rock influences and, and roots and country and blues. And, uh, you know, it's 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 like um, I am reminded, and I, we, we spoke about this, I was fortunate enough to see you back in the day, uh, right after your first album came out, you did a clinic at this guitar store that is no longer there in Sherman Oaks, California, called Guitar Guitar. And I stood yep, like five yep. feet away from you and watched you illustrate how to make slide sounds with a whammy bar and I still like damn how does the hell do you do that and I'll never forget that it was the coolest thing yeah that was a while back there wasn't <laughs> it that was back in the day that was, I'm very elderly so that's why I remember that <laughs> like so. 20 23 four years ago believe <laughs> it or not about, that's about right man but it's like you you've like you've taken all these things that you were doing 20 god awful years ago and you've morphed that into this whole other multi-dimensional thing, and it's just really awesome. Can you can you tell me what what was going on in terms of uh, how you approached the guitar and how that's evolved from say your first album to today? Yeah, well, you know, uh, you know, a lot has changed since then. But um, you know, when I first started, I did an instrumental record, and I just kind of felt like 
it was the only thing I could do at the time. I wasn't really singing, and um, I wanted to, I guess. Who doesn't want to sing? But I never really did it at that time. And so I, you know, really got into doing instrumental music. And uh, But my second record was uh, something I tried with a singer. It was a project called Howling Iguana. It kind of didn't get off the ground, but... Um, you know, that kept floating around me, me trying to work with singers and they would never do what I wanted them to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, I just, uh, you know, worked on it, you know, over the years, but, uh, starting in, I think 97, I started seriously trying to sing and it took a while. It was a lot of just work on my own, but, um, it, it just kind of came together about five years ago when I just started getting out and playing, you know, all the cover tunes that you're supposed to get out and play when you, when you, uh, when you're a singer, you got to go play your favorite songs. And so when I did that, that's when everything started clicking and it kind of helped wrap this record up. You know, it, it, it was kind of just sitting around, wasn't working until I did that. As soon as, as soon as I went out and played live and sang, you know, three hours a night, uh, things started happening and I, was able to finish the record. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Now, did you actually uh, get take like voice lessons, or did you just stick yourself up on stage and say, "Let's do it"? No, no voice lessons. Um, you know, my my range is a medium range, and uh, it's you know, I think you know, my biggest fear was forgetting lyrics. Yeah. Um, until I got up on stage, I didn't know if I would forget lyrics or not. You know, I thought I'd have one of those American Idol fr- freeze moments where you just can't do it. And, uh, you know, that never happened, thank God. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, uh, but that was the main thing. Everything else was just natural. You know, I grew up listening to all the blues rock, you know, and, um, you know, it was just a natural thing. And I'm lucky that my voice matches the style of guitar that I want to do. So that that's really, I'm, I'm lucky in that regard. Yeah, I know you're really lucky that you're not, you know, wanting to be an opera singer. You know what I mean? Right, right. It just wouldn't, that's <laughs> wouldn't really work. Be or, <laughs> there's a lot of different <laughs> styles, you know, and uh, that could that could, uh, you know, not go together. And I'm just lucky it all it all worked. So mm. was there was there a challenge for you once you started to try to build a stage performance of playing and singing at the same time? Um. You know, there was a there was a time where, um, you know, I was I was also concerned, you know, uh, if I could, you know, have the coordination to do the different rhythms and sing, and you know, I started off playing drums when I was eight. That was my first instrument, so I think I'm pretty coordinated. So that wasn't a problem. Uh, there's a couple songs, you know, obviously that just throw you for a loop, and you can't, you know, move your hands this way and sing, you know. Um, you know, it's that way unless you slow it all down and really work on it. But uh, I, I have this idea that if you can't do it on the first time, you might as well not mess with it anymore. And that's really not true because, you know, you just keep working at it. And, you know, a week later, what what was impossible is all of a sudden not not a problem. So, I, I, again, just don't give up. Keep trying it. And, you know, it might be just right over the hill what you're looking for, you know. Yeah. Well, you you pointed me toward uh, this video on YouTube. You said uh, you said the first time you sang in public was at uh, I think you said it was a 2009 uh, Nam show at, for Fender. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. and I, and I yeah. looked it up. Live live to you live to YouTube. Yeah, live to YouTube. Okay. <laughs> well, people, you got to look that up because uh, I mean, you do some great tunes, and then and then you do this uh, you do. A Voodoo Child slide return on slide on a Telecaster, and it's just the most cool thing. <laughs> and cool, you do it, thanks. And you're yeah. doing the whole. I, I wish it thing. wasn't. <laughs> I, I wish it wasn't my first performance, but <laughs> oh, yeah. on on uh, on YouTube, but <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you pulled it off really, really well, and the the, the vocals were you you sound you sounded very sure of yourself. You sound very sure of yourself, and and you got the gristle in the voice and. And and the guitar was up up in the mix and it's just awful. It was just totally awesome, man. I recommend cool, people cool. check it out. Um, I'd like to play another track from your album. This is uh, the album is called Yep, and I recommend people go out and check that out. Uh, you know, go go get it. I'm just saying, uh, just go get it. Go to uh, MichaelLeeFerkins.com and it's all that all the goodies are there. All the back back catalog, the new album you can order from there. 
Um, this track from Yep is called No More Angry Man Part 2. It goes a little like this. <laughs>
Dr. Michael Lee Perkins. Wow. Great stuff, man. Thank you. Man, that's really cool. Well, hey, you know, um, a lot of people are interested in you, and I, when I when I was uh, advertising on my uh, Facebook page and uh, OscarsGuitarShop.com, people were like, they have these great memories of you because when you came out, they was like, oh man, this is the guy, this is the guy that I've been waiting for, you know, and they and they really they they just have such great memories of your first album and your playing and, and then uh, those early years, those first three records. Um, and then and they kind of lost track with you. And, and in my interview with you early in the week, what I discovered is that you have been busy the entire time and that you really, you know, other people think you seem to drop off, but you've been going at it since the beginning. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think after my first record, uh, even when my first record came out, it was, um, you know, it was pretty successful at the time for an instrumental record, but uh, it still came out really late. I mean, it was, came out in 1990, and uh, it came out, you know, right before all the grunge and everything was taken over, which, you know, I loved all that stuff. And uh, But I think it just kind of buried the guitar thing for a while, and, you know, and the 90s went on to do all that kind of stuff and <laughs> went through ska movements and whatnot. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, I kept putting out records, but I think uh, the press wasn't really writing about them. And we didn't have the Internet in high gear either in the early 90s. It was still developing. So, you know, that just, just kind of continued. And then... Um, I slowly stopped making records. I was always recording and, and uh, doing ideas and developing my material, but it just kind of, uh, you know, we went through that whole lost period, you know, uh, with the Internet developing, and I'm kind of glad I wasn't really around, you know, trying to market things during that time because you always have to upgrade to the next uh, software. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it just seemed... Uh, you know, iTunes wasn't around yet. YouTube was barely around. So I was around, but I think the system was just working itself out. And I, I was there, man. I was I was in my my uh, practice room working on my stuff. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and from what I gather, you were really tweaking your uh, production chops. Yeah, a lot of recording. Um, went to again, went through every darn system they invented, you know, uh, that to record. You know, I went through ADAPs and tape and um, Pro Tools and you know every different system. And uh, so, you know, I think uh, eventually I found a place to build a studio at that kind of stuck. So that was about six, seven years ago. Right. Yeah, because uh, I I've been listening to your back catalog. Uh, between uh, back then and now, and it's just this, it's this great uh, progression where, you know, where whereas maybe the first record was flashier, now as you yeah. as you moved forward, there was there was a deeper meaning and more resonance, like like a good player should. He, he you know you become your 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 playing has more substance now. It's just not that it didn't then. But it's just it's got a deeper heartfelt feeling and, and it stays with you longer. It's just you feel it. I can it sticks to my Thank ribs, you. you know, it's great stuff. Thank you. That, I I feel the same way. I think you just get older and you're not impressed with all the guitar wizardry anymore. And yeah, you are searching for something that means something and for me that's always just a good idea. A good song or a good riff or a good idea. Um, that's where the cake is and you know, if you have a couple flashy moments here and there, that's great too. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm proud of that too. I appreciate that. Well, t take me backwards a little bit uh, when you were coming up as a young man and you were given a guitar. And what what kind of stuff were you playing when you was when you were learning? Um, when I started, you know, I I, I got a, a Gibson SG. And I had played acoustic for a few years before that, but my first electric was an SG, and I, I'm sure I picked that because of ACDC. Um, I think I had the, uh, my dad took me to the pawn shop, and we, I had a choice of the SG Gibson, it was a 68. Uh, actually, I think it was a 70 now that, now that I did my research, but then the other guitar was a Fender Bronco. Hmm. And, and I kind of, I had to go with the SG, you know, with the horns. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, but I was I was way into ACDC as a kid. I was way into Skinnerd, 
and Black Sabbath and Zeppelin and, you know, um, I was into all the typical, you know, Stairway to Heaven, Sweet Home Alabama and Freebird, you know, I, I played all those and, you know, wanted to know where they came from and all that. <laughs> yeah, I can, and that, you know, it's funny how that still sticks with you. The thing that you were into originally kind of stays with you. The stuff that's meaningful, because I'm in your new record, I hear a little, some Skinner kind of weaving in and out, that Southern rock kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that that was my main band for many years. Probably still is. Uh, you know, you kind of wear it out and you kind of have to uh, go back to it. But every time I hear it on the radio, it still kind of realigns, you know, my whole thing uh, to what I'm about. And um, Skinner, you know, when I was in seventh grade, that was for sure my band. I had a shirt for every day of the week was a Leonard Skinner shirt. So. <laughs> And no, no one else knew what it was. Uh, all the kids my age were kind of like, "What is that?" <laughs> yeah. And uh, but but I knew. That's cool, man. That's well, hey, that's great music, man. And and you know, uh, it's not terribly complicated, but it but it, it's very meaningful. And when you're learning, that stuff is the perfect uh, blend of of things that aren't too far over your head that mean something at the same time. As as a young guitar player learning how to do his thing on the instrument. Yeah, yeah, you could you could play it, you could play the riffs. It was kind of hard, but yeah, it was doable. Yeah, um, we didn't we didn't have the high technique going on yet with the rock stuff, you know. Besides Van Halen, uh, and that was out, I and mean, you know I I was into that too, but that was uh, that was later. You know, I had already had the other the other influences going on, but it didn't kind of hit technical until after I was already. You know, I had to learn Stairway to Heaven by myself without any instructional videos, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have YouTube back then. These kids are so lucky. Yeah, you had to. You know, we we just put the thumb on the turntable and slowed it down. And what I would do is was record the versions of the slowed down thing onto the tape, and uh, and get a good version of it slowed down, and then use the tape to to learn it instead of sit there and keep <laughs> messing with the turntable. Yeah. You know. I know that was, oh, those were the days, huh? Man, that was grueling. Kids, they got it made. They don't even know it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could go on and on about these kids these days, but you know we won't because I want to talk about um, because you know in addition to that, you you also got into players like Jerry Reed and Chet Atkins and Albert Lee, Danny Gatton. Those 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 guys are hard to learn. I mean that's that's the the, the cherry stuff for uh, versatility and uh, virtuosity. Yeah, yeah, I definitely got into that. Uh, my dad uh, turned me on to some Jerry Reed music, and it was funny when I first heard Jerry Reed. I, you know, I heard this, you know, great voice that he had, and, and when I heard the guitar, I thought, oh, it must just be some session guy that he hired. He can't play like that. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, uh, wow, he really can play that. It was it was pretty amazing because he's he's got some licks that I don't think anyone can still play. You know, so. But Danny Gatton was another influence, and you know that was a whole kind of phase two after uh, I think I was about 20 years old when I got into all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great stuff for me. Uh, I remember watching Hee Haw, and that was like my window into that whole world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I watched it too, but I I don't know why. I just I never, um, even though I love Roy Clark, I think um, you know when I heard Danny Gatton sound page in Guitar Player magazine, that's what kind of freaked me out about Danny Gatton and, and you know him kind of taking every country look that's ever been and putting it in one song was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, the whole the whole redneck jazz thing is just just it's just mind bottling, you know. I mean it's just like the I I, I, I have uh his his uh, rhythm video still and the stuff that he does is just it's like five guitar players playing at the same time. It's it's just amazing. It, uh yeah, yeah. Man. I could never learn much of it. It was more of a great influence than it was something I could actually do. But just the whole take on his telly tone, I think that's the main thing to learn from someone like Danny Gatton. It's just, you know, if you want that kind of tone, you kind of have to get a telly and an old Fender amp, and that's a good place to start. Yeah, and then he mixed these really great uh, jazz uh, chord voicings, too, with that, which is, I was really impressed by that. Yeah, it, exactly. And I've never been really great at that stuff, so I I probably ditch that as soon as I get stuck <laughs> on on one of his chord voicings. That that's the end of it, you know. <laughs> yeah, he was he was an amazing dude. 
Well, I want to I want to play more of some you. Uh, this is another track from uh, the album. Yep. Uh, this is no more angry man. This is part one. We heard part two first because you know I like to do things backwards. But check this All out. Right. This, is, this is a cool tune. <laughs> No more diamond rings No more fits just like a glove No more valentines No more angry No, you don't And you don't need to tell me about the rust on your coat And you don't need to tell me about your boring idle days Cause I've come here to blow you all away Let's play No more diamond rings Oh, 
Jaden McDaniel. <laughs> I can dig it. Wish I could do that. I wish I could do that, and I'm not ashamed to say it. True Tone Music is a virtual candy store for guitarists and bass players. They're world famous for having the best selection of new, used, and vintage guitars in the Los Angeles area. Located at 714 Santa Monica Boulevard in the city of Santa Monica, True Tone Music offers the widest selection of exceptionally high-quality guitars and basses. They stock name brands like Fender, Gibson, Guild, Epiphone, Gretsch, and much, much more. It's where the top names in the music industry shop for guitars, basses, amps, boutique pedals, and accessories. Whether you want to buy, sell, trade, get guitar lessons or repairs, True Tone Music's super cool staff is there to make your music come to life. Yes! They'll also match any online price and back it up with top-notch customer service and support. Visit them online at truetonemusic.com or call 310-393-8232. That's 310-393-8232. Ask for Ken. Say, hey, Ken, Oscar sent me. Get me a telly with a resonator in the body, just like Michael Lee Ferkins. Please, please, I need that. <laughs> man, that, that guitar that you, you have in your photos, man, with the, the, the telly. Resonator combo. Tell me about the story of how that came together. Well, you know, just uh, all the hours of, uh, you know, messing with guitars and um, shopping for guitars, you know, how we guitar players are. And, uh, you know, I sit around trying to, to mess with new guitars and get different sounds. And it just occurred to me that, uh, you know, because I'd been using a lot of resonator guitars and, I wanted to do it live, and I think the first reason I did it was because I knew I couldn't cart around a bunch of full-size acoustic type of guitars on airplanes and stuff, so I wanted to give it a shot, and I noticed the Telecaster, which is probably my favorite all-time guitar, my no-caster, um, they're just wide enough to fit uh, a resonator cone in, and so uh, my neighbor next door builds those uh, surf woody wagons. And I just brought it over. I said, hey, can you cut a hole in this for me? And uh, he messed with it. He was a guitar player, too. Actually, I think I had him do it to his guitar first to test it out because he was going to get rid of it or do something or cut it cut it up. And so he did, and it worked, man. The first one we did was just amazing. And uh, he built me two of them. And we just used uh, Fender Tellys and, uh, you know, parts off of eBay and stuff. And we put them together, and it worked the first time. And... You know, I, I road tested them, and I, I really love them a lot. They're definitely a part of my style now. So so what we have, I'm just trying to, for people in Radioland who don't know what the hell we're talking about, you've taken a telly body, and you've you've routed out the middle of the, the body, and, and that's all hollow with like a resonator inside of it now? Yeah, yeah. So there's just a little bit, if you knock on the back of the guitar, you can tell... At the other side, just a, about an eighth of an inch uh, on the back side there, um, you know, before you cut through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it definitely, you know, it lightens the guitar up a little bit, which is very cool, mm -hmm. but it still is balanced. It's not, uh, it's not, you know, the headstock's not reaching for the ground. So it's balanced, it sounds loud and acoustic, and um, I do a lot of open tunings, and so it's just perfect for slide, so... I haven't done one yet that's just standard tuning, you know, like a banjo for just regular playing, but that's probably next on the list. Okay. So is is uh, the body all hollowed out, or is it just hollow just to stick the resonator in? No, just the part where the, the you know, uh, ten and a half inch cone, uh, just that part right there, that's the only part that's hollow. I have done some other ones that are, you know, more hollowed out, but... You know, just a regular size telly, I think, is is kind of, um, you know, working. I mean, the reason I did it was because I liked the sound of a telly, and, and I really just wanted to hear a resonator, but I still wanted it to be a Telecaster. Mm -hmm. And that's the key, is that it really still kind of retains that sound of a telly and the scale length and 
uh, everything. So it was, uh, I think it was a success right from the beginning. So now we're just trying to um, see where we go from here with it. Is is that the sound that we hear at the very beginning of the last track I played? Where it's you've got a got a, you got I think you've got it panned hard left and I think it's mono. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Oh yep. wow. Yeah. Is yeah. that is that the mic? Yeah, you know it's 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 kind of you know I'm kind of getting a crazy uh, it's almost like an AM radio kind of vibe with that one. I mean you can you know get a really thick sound with it if you want or you can get the more banjo y kind of tone with it. You can you can do a lot of things if you want, but um, I just went with that for that particular song. Well, what else is interesting is that, you know, recording-wise, you can plug it into an amp and then uh, uh, mic it acoustically, and it, you'll get this kind of double sound going on for a recording. Yeah, yeah. That's what I did, you know, when I really needed the track to, to you know, feature that. I did have to go through that. I'd have three different signals. I'd have, you know, my guitar plugged into an amp. I'd have it plugged into a direct preamp, and I'd also have a microphone on it. So... The problem with that is you got to wear headphones, you know, and, and all of a sudden recording turns into this, you know, um, point your guitar at this microphone and you got to sit still and play your part without moving, you know. Right. So that, I don't like that, but I will go through all that hell if it's going to get me the sound that I want. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I do that from time to time. I go through all three sounds at once. Was the beginning of the, the, the last track, was that... Uh, done acoustically or both? Well, uh, That's in. just the acoustics of it. Nothing plugged in. Wow. That is a cool sound. That's just the mic on it. Yeah, the the whole, uh, the first song on the record, uh, the main rhythm guitar track, I, I did all, I went through a Fender Twin, a Vintage 65, um, and then, you know, mic'd it up and went direct and all that. But um, it works in all the different kind of scenarios, which is pretty amazing. It still kind of sounds like an electric guitar when you want it to, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's what I that was my next question because uh, uh, what what kind of uh, amp rig are you using with that when you're kind of going out and playing gigs? Most of the gigs I did for the past uh, five years, I used Doctor Z Remedy. Mm. Um, yeah, I just it worked really great. Um, I never really had it around my hometown to record it, unfortunately. I had all my amps in the Midwest because that's where I was based out of for, lo- for my live stuff in Omaha, Nebraska. But um, what uh, the only other amp I used besides that was the new Vox AC30 head, the hand-wired one. And that one's great, too. And I plugged that into a 412 cab. And uh, very good results with that, too. So both, both of those amps are great. Oh man, you're making me want to. Well, the amp show is this weekend here in uh, Van Nuys, California, so I'm gonna be over, just overwhelmed with amps. I'm gonna hope, hopefully, Doctor Z will be there, and I'm gonna check out the remedy. Um, what um, well, how about stomp boxes or, or whatever, whatever you're using on the floor? What's going on on the floor? Usually, uh, when I record, uh, hardly anything. I, I like to just use the amp distortion, and I usually don't use any pedals in the studio. But live, I definitely, you know, use just a, a tube screamer um, just because it's the old crutch. I'm not really cracked up about tube screamers anymore, but I'm just familiar with it. And as long as there's a pedal there to kind of give you another gain, uh, nitrous oxide uh, run, then, you know, I kind of use that a lot. But so many amps have a lot of gain now that you don't really need pedals. Right. And uh, I, I also found that, you know, when you're playing live, there's enough ambience in the room that, you know, unless echo is your, you know, your sound, most of the times I don't use a delay unless I'm in a really small uh, place with no ambience, and then I'll use some echo. But uh, I like the, I like a dry sound. I like to try to, to get everything I can without any pedals. It's just easier that way, and you don't have to. If they break down, you're not, you know, you don't all of a sudden have to go into plan B. You're just <laughs> just always kind of working, you know. Yeah, that's the thing. It's it's always uh, there's always a you know that that crisis thing. Once you've gone through that, it makes you just want to like play the amp, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I hope to keep doing that, uh, and uh, we'll see. You know, um, some of these amps have a have a little switch on them where you don't even need a pedal, and you can just you know hit the game stage, and uh, hopefully you know my next amp, uh, which might be another Doctor Z, we'll see, has uh, has that kind of feature. So. Mm. Wow. Michael Lee Ferkins, thank you so much for coming on my show. 
I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, you got a lot of stuff going on, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, set mind to purpose and visit Michael Lee Ferkins at MichaelLeeFerkins.com. Go there and purchase every piece of music he has ever written. He's got uh, great stuff and uh, and the, the yeah. videos and all that. Album, album comes out October 22nd. October 22nd. People, go get it. It's really, really good. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for showing up to the show and digging it. Um, I'd like to thank you for having me. It's, it's great to have you on the show, man. It's an honor. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Music Connection Magazine. Visit them at musicconnectionmagazine.com. Also, True Tone Music at truetonemusic.com, making your music come to life. Uh, last but not least, Mojave Amp Works. Visit the Oasis of, the Oasis of Tone at uh, mojaveampworks.com. Want to become a sponsor? Email me at oscarsguitarshop at gmail.com. Tune in next week. When our guest will be the Encyclopedia Britannica Blues Rock, Joe Bonamassa. Take care of yourselves. Be nice to each other. See you next week. Same bat time. Same bat channel.